Ready for some more startup wisdom? Great, because we're back with episode six of Sound Advice, Get Year One in Business Right, brought to you by Sage. I'm Bex Ben Calendar, and this week we are talking to entrepreneurial legend Saha Hashimi, founder of Coffee Republic. Now, this is the woman who brought US style coffee culture to the UK. Saha, thank you so much for being on the show and making time to talk to us today. How are you doing? I'm fine, the Bex. Looking forward to it, absolutely. I can't wait to to hear this story and there are so many twists and turns that I'm already on my tender hooks to hear it all. Maybe we could start sort of right at the beginning. Um, I love that you have this sort of mantra that anyone can be an entrepreneur and that you don't have to be born with this special sixth sense for business that a lot of people do do talk about. Um, And your background was that you were a lawyer, which isn't necessarily what you would class as the most entrepreneurial profession. So how did you find that actually you could do it and you could become an entrepreneur, given that that hadn't been previously your calling? Uh, Well, exactly, Bex. As you say, I I never, ever thought um, I was the entrepreneurial type. To be honest, as I always say, um, when I was growing up, there was just about one entrepreneur that I think everyone sort of knew about, someone in the press, and that was Richard Branson or I remember there was sort of Freddie Laker. These these are all sort of old names. Um, but uh, so there was not this at all idea that you could see people doing it. We, we you know we did we talked about business people. It was very corporate, and so entrepreneur was someone incredibly left field. You know, it was almost like you had to be super creative or super imaginative, and you had to be a real outlier to be an entrepreneur at that time. And sort of there was something as well that almost you had to be quite adventurous. It, I suppose it's very much the sort of stereotype of a Richard Branson. You know, the guy loves ballooning. The guy's, you know, sort of loves risk, that sort of thing. And and I definitely was, wasn't that. My, my upbringing was, wasn't like that. And I didn't even know any entrepreneurs. I didn't know a single person that had started their own business. I mean... I just it just it just wasn't in my in my immediate um, scope at all. Well, I just want to paint a bit of a picture for the listeners as well, because I I was writing for a business magazine back in the sort of early noughties, and I remember struggling to find any women to put on the cover. They were all, they were like they were like three women who who were kind of done to death, I would say, because it was there was only three. And then I remember like hearing about you and being like, yes, there are more women. And I know that sounds really crazy now because there are so many amazing female entrepreneurs but you you really were like a trailblazer back then you were unusual well I, I do think it, it kind of unusual to that extent that I think I was the only one um at that time we started telling our stories and I think um you know we did have entrepreneurs back then I mean you know every business has got someone who starts it so um you know entrepreneurship is you know wow it's, it's what kind of the some some people have done since time zero but it's just people telling their story people um, in a way saying that actually, you know, there's a system to this and this is how I did it. And because I did it this way, hopefully this will inspire you to do it. And just taking away that myth that um, it's a sort of special chromosome or almost a personality trait that some people have got and some people haven't got. Well, let's tell that story because I, I know that quite a few listeners might might already know of the Coffee Republic journey, but for those who don't, so it all started in New York. You you were a lawyer by this point, but you weren't very happy. Give us a sort of quick package tour of this journey that took you to being a founder. I was a lawyer. I had been working for five years in a law firm and getting you know quite disillusioned. I, you know, I, to be really honest, I wasn't good at what I was doing. And when you're not good at what you're doing, you don't enjoy it. And I just didn't feel sort of, you know, it was amazing. My career sort of every day going to the office felt a bit like torture because you know, I'm not using, in a way, my purpose, my, my passion. It just, it just wasn't. Um, and actually, we're going to talk about passion later, because I think passion is more, if you're good at something, that's where you find your passion. And I wasn't actually a good lawyer, to be honest, sort of, um, once I started. And But I never thought of leaving, because obviously, back then, you sort of had one career. And once you were on that career ladder, you never left. It was just idiotic to leave. I mean, we just know it was just it was just the, the worst thing you could ever do is just to sort of leap off and jump off. Um, but ha- what happened to me was, um, you know, we come, come from a close family of four and my father died very suddenly, very unexpectedly at a very young age. And it was such a shock to my system that I think that suddenly I thought, actually, 
you know, who says a career is for life? Because nothing's for life. Like, you know, I've now seen there is no comfort zone. You know, if someone's life could end like that so unexpectedly, then then what am I holding on to? Like, you know, where is that sense of security that I thought exists in life? So I think sometimes you have these sort of paradigm shifters in a way. And my dad's death was a bit of a paradigm shifter. And I said, well, you know, who says you can't leave and do something else and start something else? So the first move I made was I left this law firm. And that really was something which everyone around me was, you know, you're mad because the thing about a law firm is once you leave it, you can't ever get back in again. So it really was a leap, um, a leap into the unknown. And um, as you probably know, Bex, my uh, big motto in life is um, leap and then that will appear, is that sometimes it's only from taking that leap um, that we see what's out there. And so many people are sort of on the cliff edge thinking about the leap, looking at that sort of huge jump, and it's a really terrifying place. But somehow, um, I think after my dad's death, Instead of looking, you know, sitting at the cliff edge, looking at that sort of jump and thinking about what I wanted to do, I just did it. I just, 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 I just did it. I just left. And I just thought that there must be something better here. And, um, so when I left, um, I had nothing to do and I'd never not worked before. And my brother Bobby, um, uh, was at that time working in New York. And I went to visit him because I thought, actually, I've got some spare time and, I could stay in his apartment for free. So that was just already, that was an incentive. And I thought, why not take advantage? And it was really there that I got the idea um, that first morning I arrived in New York um, and woke up a jet lag morning looking for a cup of coffee. And that very first morning I came across this thing called New World Coffee. And I saw for the very first time these American style coffee bars and I just um, fell in love with it. I just thought, you know, what a wonderful way to start the morning. I still now, um, when I talk about it, even now I could just remember like the smell of the place, smell of coffee. It was just such a wonderful way to start the morning. And it's sort of, I suppose I kind of, I fell in love with it. But um, yeah, and that that was really the genesis. But um, that, 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 that was how I got the sort of famous light bulb. So you came back to London and what I love about you is that you were like, well, that works over there. And you were just, you, I mean, I don't know if cheeky is the right word, but you guys just kind of copied it outright to the, to the point that you were like copying the menu. I mean, that just sounds like real chutzpah. Talk to me how you did the whole replication. Yeah, no, I just remember actually, um, where I was when, when I got back, um, uh, the, my brother was actually still in New York and I just remember, you know, genuinely, I got back and, you know, I was stuck in London, stuck at home without a job and thinking, oh my God, I want to leave the house in the morning and I want somewhere just like what I saw in New York. I just couldn't believe. Um, and it's difficult, I think, for younger people um, to believe that at that time there was nowhere to go for a cup of coffee in the morning. There was just nothing. You had to wait until a restaurant opened or a sort of cafe um, otherwise, you had sandwich bars and you could go and get a sandwich, but it wasn't really conducive to, you know, a great cup of coffee because it was all about the sandwich and about lunchtime and they didn't really get, get going in the morning. So there was absolutely nowhere to go in the morning to leave your house. And I just really missed it. And I just remember, you know, just thinking, my God, this is amazing. I remember just thinking it like in our kitchen and then um, that we went, my brother came to London um, to visit my mum and I, and we went for this Thai meal. And I remember in the Thai restaurant saying to my brother, gosh, do you know what? Sort of, I'm now not working. I just wish we had those coffee bars I saw in New York. I was like, listen, it was such an amazing thing. I just wish we had them. I just love to leave the house and start my morning in one of these buzzy coffee bars. I just, I just can't believe we haven't got them. I just wish we had them. And it was just a typical conversation, you know, many people have when you what seen something abroad or you miss it. I never said it with any sort of an intention. Um, but there in the middle of this sort of time meal, my brother got the light bulb. It was actually him who suddenly said, I, I can't believe you've said this, but this is a brilliant business idea. And, you know, I never knew about business or what business ideas were or how they come about. And he was like, this is, this is a great business idea because he'd actually heard of sort of Starbucks when he was working in New York. Someone had mentioned this huge coffee trend coming. And when he said to me, um, he said, we should bring this idea to the UK. My idea was, my sort of response was almost like, you're mad, you know. 
I sort of said to him, you know, I only meant it as a customer because I'm a customer. So yeah, you know, great, but let me wait until someone brings this concept to the UK. Um, I just in my I just would have never thought why would we be the one to bring this to the UK? It was almost as a customer why ha- that I have to provide a solution to my own problem. You know, other people do this, but that was really when um, you know my brother was like, listen. I know you don't want to do it, and I definitely did not want to do it because I just thought there should be other people to do this because I was a customer and there are other people that open coffee bars. Um, but very cleverly, actually, he led me through this way. He said, okay, if you don't want to do it, then just do some research for me um, because I think this is brilliant. You know, what if I pay you to do some research for me? And that was the only reason why I, I, I went for it and I didn't leave that dinner as, oh, well, that was just an idea and, and wait until someone else brought those coffee bars to the UK. It was just, he sort of almost led me down that path of, okay, step one, do some market research. And um, and that's what I did the, the very next day. Um, as I've told the story many times, I got on the circle line and my market research was getting off at every single stops on the circle line to see what there was. And of course, there was nothing like it. So after that one day on the circle line, I became even more convinced that there was a real gap in the market. I wasn't convinced this was a brilliant business idea. I just knew that there was nothing like what I'd seen in New York. So you started with the market research. I love this because I feel like we're almost like laying the path that you follow. When you, So you've got the great idea or you've got the, the germ of an idea. So you started with research. And then what happened next? Was it kind of business plan, raising finance? Did you, did you follow the very standard journey or did you kind of take a roundabout route? Um, it, was, it was a very standard journey and I never really realised it was a standard journey. So I did that journey. I did that sort of... Um, day's journey on the circle line and I got home and I thought wow this is amazing there's nothing like it and then um really after that it, it, it was uh, doing market research and um you know in in the book um we wrote anyone can do it I've got the faxes between my brother and I because he was then kind of traveling quite a bit so we had to fax each other and it was the next step was okay let me find out more if there's a gap gap let me find out more and so we set about to write a business plan but in a way it took three months of market research before we could write the business plan. So, and for me, a business plan is, as you know, Bex, just answering some questions about what is it you're going to do? How are you going to do it? Who are you going to do it with? How much is it going to cost? You know, how big is the market? What's the potential? So in answering all these questions, we had to do some research ourselves and really get our head around, you know, great. I've seen coffee bars in New York. Looks like a great concept. I love it as a customer. But does it fit this market? You know, is there anyone else doing it? Do we drink coffee in the UK or are we permanent tea drinkers? Because tea drinking seems to be a fashion in this country. So you have to do a bit of research and no one's going to help you through the research. And you're never going to get the, oh, yeah, you've done the research and this is a brilliant business idea. No, you're just going to get these little snippets that, oh, wow, that's good. That, you know, that looks like that. That's open. Looks like that's a potential. Let me go further. Um, so I think sometimes people look for too much certainty in a business idea. Um, you know, they look to, to, to you know, for it to know. You, you never know if, it, if it's a great business idea. But just every day that you progress, it sort of leads you to the next day and the next day and the next day. And it's that sort of saying that, you know, it's sort of almost 1% every day um, gets you to sort of 100% eventually in three months. But I think that that's a journey. It's a really slow journey of just persuading yourself because if you're not persuaded yourself you there's no way you can persuade others so the first person you've got to sell the idea to is yourself because you've got to really believe in it and that's where your persistence comes from and that's why market research is actually so important so we did the market research and it ended in a business plan um that was just great because it's like a brain dump it's sort of everything you know in there you sort of document it as it's fresh in your mind, because there's no point getting information, as you know, it sort of goes goes in one year out the other. So you write it out, you sort of, you logically go through it in a way. And that's where you've got the business plan and it becomes a great sales document, it becomes a great mission statement for you. It's the DNA of your business, essentially, your business plan. But what I want to get my head around is the fact that there wasn't the market there wasn't the coffee drinking habit in the UK already. So you you were going to have to educate, as you say, the nation of, of tea drinkers. So how did you know 
that, I mean, did you do focus groups and did people say, oh yeah, I could be converted to coffee? Or did you just have to go on the gut instinct that that people would come around and people would fall in love with it the same way that you had? Um, very good question, Bex. Well, the thing is about an entrepreneur is entrepreneurs can't do focus groups because focus groups, you know, cost money and, you know, that kind of market, and you can't even buy market research. I remember, um, you know, looking to see if I could buy a couple of these Mintel reports and they were fortunes and you can't afford it. Um, so a couple of stuff I did, I went to City Business Library and I just spent a whole day thinking, let me research at this market because you could actually access a lot of this market research in a library. And at that time, you had sort of photocopy the pages or whatever. Actually, or maybe you couldn't even photocopy. Maybe even that was illegal. Um, so I sort of, you know, I, I looked at the entire market and what we saw was that actually um, we were nation of tea drinkers. We drank seven times more tea than we drank coffee at that time. And that um, what was really interesting as well was that um, of the coffee we drank, 90% of it was instant. Um, and that, you know, obvious, you could sort of see everyone drinking instant. But what was really interesting was that in Europe, um, 90% of the coffee drunk was real coffee, you know, the, sort of the way we make it now in the form of espresso or, you know, it was ground coffee rather than sort of instant manufactured coffee. And I just remember um, in a couple of these reports I read in the library, it said that actually we're developing more European habits because at that time EasyJet had just started and there was the sort of beginning of low-cost travel. So we were taking on a lot of the um, European habits, you know, suddenly croissants and things like that. You know, people were sort of, all those croissant places were opening. And so it was this idea that actually, you know, we're going to blend in more with European habits. So you're seeing like a huge discrepancy, 90% real coffee in Europe, 90% instant us. Um, and we were, you know, drinking much less per capita coffee than, than other countries were. And yet, you know, the borders were sort of going away with the whole low-cost travel. People were traveling, getting, getting other sort of, you know, it was all infiltrating. So, I could see that that, in my logic of persuading myself, was actually, this is going the way because, you know, we're, we're not like stuck in a sort of island insulated anymore. And we're going to develop these habits. And, you know, others very much like us drink much more coffee. So the potential was huge to move people. And frankly, to me, um, I think, you know, business has got to be personal. People say it's not personal. For me, it should be incredibly personal. So I thought, actually, it's a no-brainer because... I don't want to drink, if I have a delicious caramel cappuccino made properly with a proper foam and the most delicious kick of a double espresso properly done, I might want to go back to my Nescafe instant. No, it's just, you know what I mean? That you just can't even compare the experiences. So really from what I saw myself and what I, what I liked, I just figured out it's like a no brainer because who, I mean, you know, no one's going to prefer instant over real coffee. I mean, I know some people still love instant, actually. I've met some people who actually love instant, but, you know, it just, so it just, you've got to sort of somehow, yes, do the research and see, you know, that's, those are the figures, but as well, um, think, you know, then you've got to sort of, it, I suppose it's a combination of hard facts and figures for market research together with your own instincts. You can't just go on your own instinct and you can't just go on hard facts. You've got to combine them together. I kind of, call it so educated gut instinct I love that there's this whole confluence of trends that you spotted because if someone said to me what has EasyJet got to do with the nation's coffee drinking habits I would never have seen the link until you just explained it to me yeah and another trend actually was um, friends and sort of central perk friends was massive then and they got together in central it was just everything was going towards it you could just see so everything was changing so yeah absolutely oh that's brilliant I love that so then how did you end up opening your first one um where did the money come from how how tough was it when you hadn't you know done anything like that before tell me about that first store yeah I mean well basically when we did the business plan we calculated we needed about 90 grand to open the first store and um the question is you know where do you find 90 grand from um my brother was a banker in his job and I thought he could raise money but he had no idea how to raise 90 grand (laughs) bankers didn't really raise that sort of money and I remember um, we went off actually to Waterstones um, had just opened in um, Piccadilly and it was like this amazing store. And I remember it had a small business section and I remember the small business section was actually right below. So I had to actually get on my knees on the carpeted, on the red carpet Waterstones, I remember, to find the small business section because it was just, and there was just this one book and this tiny little shelf. And now when you think how enormous those business sections are, 
there was literally like on my knees, I found this book called the Lloyd's TSB, how to start a small business guide. Um, I've still got, I've still got it actually um, sitting in my library. It's very old leaf through copy, but I just remember it, it had this in sort of sections and it was how to raise money. And I opened it thinking, you know, my God, this guide, how to raise money. And it was just like one sentence, sort of go to a bank, <laughs> what, go to a bank, like, as simple as that. Um, but it was as simple as that. And I just remember, um, you know, we called up a bunch of banks, called up my own bank manager at Lloyd's, but there was not much goodwill there, kind of from my overdraft. So kind of he wasn't going to help. So we just started randomly calling bank managers to see who would give us a loan. I mean, it was just literally going through um, the yellow pages and calling bank man. We'd speak to whoever would pick up the phone. I mean, did this was a level, you know, when I, if someone didn't pick up the phone, we didn't bother leave a message, just safety and numbers. We just called up so many and we ended up calling 40 uh, bank managers. And of those, we got interviews with um, uh, 26 bank managers. And so we got interviews with 20 bank managers. And um, and that that was how it went. So we, we called 40, got 20 interviews. And the first 19 bank managers were terrible and said to us that this idea is crazy and, you know, we're a nation of tea drinkers and why would on earth would you bring coffee to nature tea drinkers? And they said, they sort of looked at our sort of draft menu and they were like, God, these fancy coffee names, you know, people are going to hate it. They were like, this is so American. People are never going to call something like a skinny latte or a, you know, kind of backyard or something like that. And they were literally, um, and it was so awful leaving um, and just thinking, oh my God, like, I just remember like just driving back. And um, I just remember being so disillusioned. Uh, but somehow, you know, kind of, I believe eventually the persistence test, the 20th bank manager said yes to us and said he'll give us the loan. Um, and we couldn't believe it. And we got the loan guaranteed under the small firms loan guarantee scheme which is now sort of the enterprise uh, finance grant. So, um, you know, the sort of, because we had nothing to put up against security for the 90 grand bank loan, uh, thank God the government scheme um, helped guarantee that bank loan. And that's how we got, got, got the bank loan. And that's how we got going. How did you get over all those no's though? Because ha- after the first 10, I mean, how did you keep dragging yourself to another meeting and keep kind of building yourself back up when people were just trying to tear you down the whole time? You've got to believe in the idea yourself. Now, um, be, because you've got to have persuaded yourself that this this is brilliant. Now, um, there's as well, one mustn't overstate that because... I, we did not go around thinking, oh, this is a brilliant business idea. and This is going to be big. There was just somehow, there was just this feeling of, um, uh, you know, there was just sort of somehow this feeling of they haven't actually had, they haven't been to New York. They haven't seen those coffee bars. They haven't seen that wonderful buzz of the coffee bars. They probably don't even drink coffee. So, and they've had one minute to listen to my presentation. They probably had a bad day. You know, this is my idea and they haven't really thought about it. And they're just saying something so, you know, they haven't really know as much as as we do about it. So that sort of got us going. And um, But in a way, I think persistence is something that we've all got to learn. And um, I had learned about persistence from my parents. You know, they'd always told me that you're not going to get a yes the first time round. You know, even when I got a job in a law firm, I was rejected by the same company three times until they were. So I was sort of used to persistence. And I think, um, you know, that's when I suppose sort of some hab- you know habits right up to that come up that, you know, if you expect to get a yes and to ask people to validate your idea, you're going to be really in trouble. And the whole sort of thing is you everyone's going to be against you and it's okay to get a no. So, mm-hmm. you know, I had that mindset, I suppose, of it's okay. It's just, it's normal. People you say no, but you've got to be persistent until you get the yes. So I, I, I think it's something that, you know, if you understand that all great ideas, everything you want to do, will be met with rejection. You almost expect rejection rather than see it as, as something. And, you know, I come across so many entrepreneurs now who, um, you know, as soon as they've got a great idea, they go around excited, telling other people about it. And those people are just absolute balloon poppers. And then they just give up just because someone else was, you know, rolled their eyes when you said something. And that happens so often. And that's why I always say, keep it quiet yourself. So you really, you know, develop the kind of muscle and the persistence because, you know, everyone's going to kind of pour cold water over your idea and kind of denigrate it when you say it. It's just it's just normal human reaction. So that's why you mustn't share your idea with many people because 
they can so put you off so massively from a brilliant idea you've got. I love that you call them the balloon poppers. It's so they true. Are. And the family family are the worst for it as well. Oh you, tell God, your, yeah. you tell your parents, you've got this great business there, uh, pop, off it goes. Yeah, and, and not, I mean, not wishing to be, um, if, for all the, all the sort of female, potential aspiring female entrepreneurs, uh, women very much have this issue. You know, the first thing they do is ask their partner and their sort of partner, kind of who's meant to know, you know, sort of... Um, <laughs> Victorian era meant to know better perhaps um, you know they, they sort of say oh god don't do it and so many you know then they don't do it because you know I suppose your family members are trying to protect you and they're trying to sort of they don't want it you know they're sort of trying to guide you but they actually end up putting you off and I always say just don't discuss it with anyone when you've when you've got a great idea because um, if you'll regret it afterwards because they're going to say no. But you didn't have that opportunity that you didn't have that experience because Bobby obviously was a massive supporter, wanted you to do it. Tell me about working with your brother and how how that worked for you too. Did you fight like cat and dog or did you just get along? Was it smooth sailing the whole way through? Talk to me about how that relationship affected the success of Coffee Republic. Yeah, no funny that. I mean, but, but it wasn't that Bobby was a supporter. I mean, it was Bobby had sort of initially come up with the idea and he, you know, he'd always wanted to start his own business. So I was very lucky because, um, you know, he knew about business. He, you know, he'd been to business school and, you know, initially he'd always had this thing about starting his own business. So, you know, in, in a way, um, there, there, he had a sort of certainty about it in a way that I, that I didn't. And um, I think sometimes I, you know, I always say the two of us together because, became the perfect single entrepreneur because, you know, I had the idea, I was the ultimate customer. You know, if there was a bubble in my head, it was sort of the muffins and the kind of coffee and what syrup we're going to have and what sort of ice drink we're going to have. And my brother was the one turning those ideas into a business, sort of into numbers, turning into business. So he he really, really had the vision, I have to say. Um, and, and it was brilliant. Um, I have to, uh, you know, it just... I think siblings are a great one to start a business. If you've got the sort of sibling relationship I've had with Bobby, which is we used to fight the whole time and kind of almost plot each other's deaths, like kind of, <laughs> and then next minute you'd sort of forget about it. So, I mean, I mean, literally, you know, I sort of say we got our, tra- our training in the sand pit because he's one of the, he's probably the only person still in life that I can say exactly whatever I want to. And then next minute, sort of, you know, five minutes later, be like, hey there, let's go for a drink. You know, you're sort of used to fighting with your sibling. I think people are used to fighting with their siblings. So we could fight over things and that made it much easier. So if we disagreed, and gosh, did we disagree about so many things. But, you know, there was, there was we literally have an enormous fight about it and one of us would win, but at least it clears the air. And so you've got to make sure you start the business with someone that you can regularly clear the air with because you don't want any tension building up. That's great advice. Um, and so your first shop opened, I think it was South Moulton Street, and that was 1995. How did you get the first people through the door? Did you have like any clever tricks to get people to try this new place? What was your marketing stance back then? Gosh, well, our marketing stance, um, actually, Bex, it was you know, going back to the, I think the opening was the 5th of November, exactly, as you say, 1995. And I just remember um, it was just terrifying. So, I um, mean, you know, just actually opening in itself was terrifying, let alone doing any marketing about opening. So, you know, the opening day was, I just remember thinking like, how many pints of milk do I order for a coffee bar? <laughs> you know, that, that, I mean, at the moment you could probably, there are so many coffee bars that probably there is some formula, but there was no formula. You know, how many pints of milk are you going to get? Who's going to order skim milk? How many people are going to order full fat milk? How many people are going to order soya milk? And so it was just this real guesswork. And I just remember, um, because we couldn't get a milk delivery, me going to literally Sainsbury's and getting the milk and, you know, dropping it off. And um, and we opened the doors and it was terrifying because I thought people were going to come in individually and suddenly they would come in like all together with their kids making a mess. The store would be full. We had no experience how to deal with the queues. Um, and I just remember it was, it was an awful day and I always remember that day and I often go to South Bolton Street and, and remember how terrified I was that day. And then like I remember around two o'clock we ran out of milk and where do you buy milk? You didn't have those little express supermarkets. And I remember Selfridges was the closest place that sold to any food nearby and we had to go to Selfridges Food Hall <laughs> and buy their fancy milk just to kind of continue. Do you remember it was that sort of chaotic day? It was just, it was by no means a fairy tale. Um, so that was great on the Saturday, but then Monday came and it was really quiet. 
because we, you know, that obviously sort of November um, already starts a Christmas shopping Saturday and we were just off Oxford Street. So that was great. But Monday, you know, no one came in. And when I say no one came in, our break even sales were £700. But every single day for the first six months, we were making only £200. And when I say £200, I'm discounting my mum who was coming in every single day, drinking as many cappuccinos as you possibly <laughs> humanly can drink. Um but, you know, so we just knew we, we didn't get that many customers. And that's when we started marketing massively. I just remember, um, you know, deliveries and deliveries were really inconvenient. But we started, you know, kind of just quickly doing leaflets, um, leafleting all the nearby offices. Then I remember we had a sort of gap opposite us and, and we sort of gave up loyalty cards that we had stamped them like kind of eight times so people just had to buy two coffees to get get a free coffee you know anything i would go around myself um i would put our first two employees out on the street with kind of these sort of vanilla lattes for people to taste it you know you've got to do everything and i always have this thing whereby um when i see new stores opening and when i see they're just sitting there waiting i'm like oh my god this store is not going to last and i almost have this bet with my husband because whenever i see one in our neighborhood and they're not logging it like at the beginning i'm like oh my god there's no hope they're going to close um you've got to really really flog a business you know what i mean you just got to like get out there and try to almost get momentum around the business because i think a business is like a human being and if you let it just like flat line in the beginning it just doesn't, you've got to give energy to a new business. It's, it's about energy. It's really funny. You've got to, you know, even if you give out loads of freebies in the beginning, the fact that your store is full and people are seeing people going in and getting things, um, it just adds to the energy. It adds to the momentum around the business. Because if you think about it, a business starts in complete inertia and you've got to get, get it going. You remember, it's almost like a sort of plane taking off. You've got to use so much energy to get it to take off. And once it you know takes off, you're going to be more comfortable. But just like a plane's at full throttle when it takes off, you got to put every energy you can, be on top of it, whatever you can to get customers through the door. And if you believe um, in your product, get them tasting your product. And because you believe in it, you think once they taste it, they're going to come back. It's like you've converted them. So we used to actually call it converting customers one at a time because we were you know convinced that once they go there, and had a, have a great cup of coffee, they're not going to go back to the old greasy spoon sandwich bar. They're not going to be happy in the office kitchen making a, um, instant coffee or out of the coffee machine. They're going to want to come back for this experience because it was so great. And that's why, again, we go full circle back into really believing in the experience. This is what I really love about your advice. I think that it just it's so human. And actually, I've read, um, you've written kind of 10 shifts for entrepreneurs. And I read them and I've actually print, printed them out because I feel like they're not just advice for being successful in business. They're, they're advice for being successful in your life. <laughs> Things like be a big kid, attack bureaucracy, act on the small everyday ideas, get outside. I mean, all of these things, I literally got them printed on my wall because it's just, that is how you create the momentum for anything, any project. Absolutely, Bex. Yes, um, no, thank you for doing that. No, I believe that exactly. It's sort of, it's almost like the sort of entrepreneurial life, you know, sort of the kind of not only the startup, the startup of you. It's sort of, um, you know, just, just, just getting out there, getting ideas, doing stuff, learning, you know, constantly learning and trying something new and not sort of flatlining. I think it, it's, it's so important. And it's just sort of, it's stuff you can do in a big company and, and you can do that constantly in life. Absolutely. So Coffee Republic grew. I think at its height, there were 110 stores. So how did you find that scale up journey? How did you manage that growth? And, and what was your experience of it becoming so much bigger and, and much harder, I suppose, to, to manage in your scrappy startup, full of energy and momentum founder way? Um, yeah, so, so you know, we, we, were, we were working from home at the beginning when we had like the one store, my brother and I both moved back in to live with my mom. And so our house was this sort of center of activity. And then um, we actually sort of opened another six stores um, working from home. But then, you know, the home no longer became home because then we had to have a sort of bookkeeper and deliveries were coming to my poor mum's house. So, so it was all sort of a bit taken. And we lived in a block of flats and I was worried that all the other neighbours would start complaining about the amount of commercial deliveries we get here. Um, but then um, when we got to seven stores, we actually um, went on a big um, money raising and we ended up um, kind of reversing this company on AIM. So 
we suddenly were a listed company at seven stores. Can you imagine? Um, and that was only sort of two years after we'd started. And I remember um, we had to have a finance director full time because if you're on AIM, you had to have a finance director. And I just remember saying to my brother, so um, which bedroom are we going to put the finance director in? Which is really when um, <laughs> we thought, okay, we've really got to move to an office. And we moved into this office actually. Um, and it was lovely because we were still sort of, we were, you know, we had seven stores, but still really entrepreneurial. You know, we sort of hired people. There, there wasn't, it wasn't an exciting company yet. So no one knew about it. The whole coffee bar thing hadn't started. So we got sort of quite kooky people, but somehow people who'd, there was something about them. They were, I think they loved this concept like, like we did, you know, they loved coffee or they sort of somehow believed in Bobby and I, there was like a sort of, there was a sort of chemistry, you know, when they came and we were just it was the most incredible um, uh, few years like that, this original team we had. And, you know, someone like literally we'd hire a receptionist and then she would think, oh my God, I love property. So she would literally go and head up our property or, you know, I mean, it was the most extraordinary thing. Um, people just gravitated and we had like people had pet stores and we grew this up to sort of 30 stores very much like that you know really you know keeping close to customers we'd have all the meetings in the stores um you know whatever we wanted there were no rules there was no bureaucracy no one like had titles either you know we literally we were like title list completely everyone just was just busy doing their own thing and um but just there was just this sort of cohesion and i suppose like a soul um, and the soul was sort of serving. We were all serving Coffee Republic. We were all serving this little idea. And it, it all sort of led us kind of to wherever we needed to go. Um, and then suddenly, you know, like this, we got to 30 stores and, you know, it became a sort of big hit and people were talking about it. And um, suddenly we thought this was around like the year 2000. And I remember the FT had just named us one of the great brands of Great Britain. And, you know, we, we'd sort of done really well. And, um, it was at that time that we thought, oh, now I suppose this is what people call, you know, if we've done so well with this management team that's frankly completely clueless and no one's got any idea what they're doing and no one's got great CVs. Imagine if we really wrap this up and get the best people with the best CVs who really know what they're doing, who've done expansion. Imagine like how amazing it would be. Um, and that's what we did. We sort of started hiring, you know, people we hired, actually a lot of people from pret manger because they were ahead of us in their growth. And, um, and you know, this sort of idea was, listen, we were entrepreneurial before, but now we don't need to be entrepreneurial anymore. We want to be a proper big company. So we hired people from Nestle and, you know, big companies who knew about coffee. So it was almost this sort of, you know, what Silicon Valley says, or we brought the grown-ups in because we thought the business needs grown-ups. But the exact opposite happened of what we were we were hoping for, because I just remember we we hired someone and he said I want to become managing director, and he said for example to me Saha, um, what's your title? And I was like I haven't got a title, I just do everything. And he was like, well, what do you do mostly marketing? Okay, you become marketing director. You know, everyone had specific sort of titles, and it was almost like I could see sort of silos going up. If physically you could see a silo going up, you know they came in and they brought all these systems and controls and suddenly it was all about, okay, you know, no one discuss anything until we've got the mon the Monday meeting and then we could discuss everything then. And just suddenly these like systems and controls and procedures came in and just everything changed. Um, we literally went full swoop from really entrepreneurial to really corporate and just everything changed from then. And, um, you know, we sort of grew the company and this all sort of happened quite slowly. So I suppose everything changed when we got to about 80 stalls where slowly, you know, it takes time for culture to change because culture is like, it's a bit sort of, um, it's about your behaviors. But after a while, when people bring in procedures, behaviors start changing. So we, you know, we grew it from, you know, it was like the one, then six, 30, 60, 80 per year. So in five years, we grew to 110. And when we got to 110 stores, very much, I felt like, oh God, um, this is a really corporate company anymore. And it just doesn't feel the same. It's almost like we lost the soul. We lost that customer connection. Um, it was all, all about what your boss is doing and what the appraisal is and what the next management meeting is. And it just all became about what was going on in the head office and not in the stores. And I lost touch with the company in a way. I, I, I sort of thought as well, I'm not needed. I felt quite distanced from it. I felt like the company doesn't need me anymore. Um, I suppose it's, it's, it's how parents feel when their child becomes an adult. 
And at that time, um, people were making sort of hints that actually, well done for starting the company, you entrepreneurs, it's time for you guys to leave and give it to the sort of big boys to run, the sort of corporates to run. And that's what we did in 2001. Um, Bobby and I sold our shares and we resigned from the company because we were told, you know, give it to us and we can grow this property now. You know, you've done a good job so far, but, you know, we, we, we've got to do this properly. We've got to run this business properly, like a big business that it is. And we left and um, it was like um, very sad, but we left in April 2001, sort of almost like five years after we started. Do you think that it would have been possible to grow it and keep the soul? Or do you think that it's like part and parcel of becoming a big company that you have to lose some of that culture? I very much believe that um, the soul is the most important thing the company's got. The soul is what gives the company that that special feeling, that sort of very much where that mutual purpose, that innovation, that real connection with customers. And soul is something you should never lose. You know, the companies we see at the moment um, that are growing so fast, they've managed, you know, the sort of Silicon Valley companies people talk about, they call themselves the biggest start, you know, the sort of billion dollar startups because they've still got that startup mentality, that soul, because they understand how important that soul is. And the thinking back then, you know, I suppose back then life happened much slower. So companies didn't need to change and innovate. So, you know, you could just turn it corporate, but, you know, the times have changed now and I think soul is what is the glue that kind of ties the, that special feeling about the company. And once you lose that, you lose the innovation, you lose the customer connection, you lose what makes it special. I very much wish that, um, you know, we, we, we'd, we'd stayed on in a way just to keep that soul and maybe had others that, you know, could, could have run it, but we'd have, we, we would have been that sort of keep that soul alive because it's something that, um, that's very special and it's the real sort of, engine of a company once you lose that i think um there, there's that there, 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 there's not much left and you know for us it was it was a real cutoff because we didn't realize how important that soul was i feel like that's really good advice because i a lot of entrepreneurs a lot of founders think that other people can do it better than them and you see a cv and all these sparkling brands and you just presume the doubt sets in you just presume that you might not be the right person anymore but in fact you were the right person you and bobby were the right people it just it kind of just got away from you there yeah exactly and you know there's something about sort of being the right people and yet um you know there were certain things we weren't good at like i don't think i'm actually good at managing thousands of people but you know the thing is you've got to get someone who understands how important the soul is i always tell the story of the founder of ebay who got the sort of famous ceo meg whitman who's gone on to do to do big things and you know she was like i'm going to come and run the company but i want you at my right hand to tell me about the stuff that i don't know because i didn't start the company so it's someone that appreciates how important that passion is you know it's the reasons why a sort of Howard Schultz goes back into Starbucks because he feels people have lost that feeling you know what I mean it's why Michael Dell goes back it's the whole sort of um uh, uh, Steve Jobs story of going back into Apple it's 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 realizing how important that is and um if we'd done it again I would have loved to have kept there kept that sort of kept that customer connection that that that, that, that extra special something that, that a founder can bring, uh, that sort of passion, you know, um, I wrote an article about it, sort of, and I headed the article, what's love got to do with it? And I think um, a lot of people say, you know, what's love got to do with a company? It's, you're being too personal, but it is personal. And, the, you know, the way it's personal is we were the customers. You know, we had this amazing insight of what the customer experience was so we could adapt really quickly and that's what was special. And we had the time and we had that sort of connection with it. But once you get the corporates in, um, I remember, you know, as soon as they came in, they were too busy to see what the customer experience was in a way. It was just too, you know, but by the time they saw it in the market research reports, they were too busy sort of running the company and forgetting about what essentially runs the company is the customer. So um, it's very much that feeling, I think. And I, I see that a lot exactly because, as you say, a lot of founders think, oh, I need to bring someone else in who knows what to do. And I always tell founders, don't underestimate how much you know. By all means, you bring someone else. But another thing important, which I think a lot of the business owners will um, relate to, and I think especially after this sort of hell everyone's been through this year, is sort of fatigue almost. You know, when you start the company, it's relentless. And 
it's 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 sort of you're tired and you're so tired that you just think i just want to be done with this and i come across so many um founders who are like oh god i can't wait to sell i've just done with it and i'm like if you're tired don't quit have a rest have a sabbatical take some time off from it but it's it's no reason for you to quit and i think it's that combination of underestimating your own abilities as a founder and what you've got plus the sort of fatigue that sets in that you've done it it's relentless 24/7 it's all you think about and you just at one point just want to be like oh my god what a dream um i want to be done with it and gosh the amount of people i've met who do that and then end up regretting it that's a good warning there to anyone listening who's reaching that breaking point and needs a break but it should just be a break don't yeah. jack it all in exactly um, but if you hadn't left maybe you wouldn't have gone on to write your extraordinary books and become such an amazing mentor to big businesses who want to keep their startup culture talk to me about what your passions are today and what's been born out of that amazing business and amazing startup um yeah i mean i suppose you know exactly there's no point sitting there regretting thinking yeah, you know i ended up um, writing anyone could do it my first book about the whole experience and you know at that time no one had written about their experience the sort of warts and all breakthroughs and breakdowns you know something where actually listen there is a system to this and anyone can do it and um then i wrote that and then um it, it sort of i got on the speaking circuit telling my story which has been incredible i've come across the most incredible people the most incredible businesses i've traveled around that and sort of really my current passion is this idea of um you know as you said yourself bex that sort of entrepreneurial thinking that we can all do and it's just a sort of different way of, of of living life and especially in big companies and i think um you know as we emerge into hopefully a amazing post covid era after everything everyone's been through um everyone needs to you know it's almost like we have to start again don't we after this we need new energy in our businesses new energy in our companies and so again you know that startup mentality is going to become ever more relevant because in a way after this a lot of businesses are going to be starting up again you've got to kind of rise from the ashes again and get going cuz you know customers have been asleep experiences have been really different and um and it's just like actually you know the pace of change is such that it is like starting up cuz in a way you're relaunching into a slightly in, in into a new world i think so it's like where do i fit in so it's very much like like you are starting again so that mentality is becoming really even more important and um as you say in my book startup forever i've got just you know the couple of crucial things about that mentality because it's not like a magic again it's just go back to your customers cut the bureaucracy you know forget about everything you know keep trying things bootstrap you know do things on the cheap just just keep trying be persistent and those little habits if you um adopt them i think give you that joy of the sort of startup mentality and that sort of satisfaction that and i think that's the sort of um silver lining really of all this you're right in that 2021 will be a very unusual year and given that a lot of people listening have just started a business or thinking about it i'd love to hear what you think they need to do to trade in a year like 2021 and beyond i've read research that shows it's been really polarizing some people are struggling and they're on the breadline others have saved so much money people are able to buy a house because they haven't gone out for a year it's a totally polarised demographic. That must be incredibly unusual because the bit in the middle is missing. So what skills do entrepreneurs need to be successful right now? Oh, then the, you, the, the, the way I see exactly, it's just I think for a lot of people, it is survival. You know, the businesses have really suffered. People just generally, people are not in set, you know, kind of in the consumer world. I mean, I haven't been buying anything. I don't know about you. I mean, I just can't believe when I look at my credit card bills. I mean, I've got no desire or incentive to purchase or go out or, you know what I mean? We've all just gone into sort of a lowest common denominator of just sitting in our track pants watching Netflix, frankly, in the evening. So it's just, you know, it's just remembering actually we are going to come out of this and um, it's still the consumer out there. You know, the world hasn't changed and people haven't become computers. It's still people with a head, with a heart, with a soul, and they're going to want things. So, you know, when you're in your business, you just got to think, number one, at the moment, it's survival. It's about keeping your costs as low as you can. So, um, you know, and something my brother always taught me was, as an entrepreneur, it's a question of staying at the table long enough. You know, you don't want to run out of money. So, 
you know, keeping your costs as low as you can so you survive this bumpy time we're going through at the moment. And hopefully come spring, summer, people are going to be longing to get out there and do stuff and live life to the full, which is what, what we haven't been doing. And, you know, are you prepared for that? Because, you know, the customer's got to come out there, but how are you going to meet that customer need? So it all goes back to the DNA of entrepreneurial thinking, which is go back to your customers, which is why I stop always with my story is I fell in love with those coffee bars in New York because I wanted it as a customer myself. And it's that customer experience that you've got to absolutely get into your head and look at your business from your customer's point of view. There's no point saying, I've got this business and this is what I sell. No, just say, who am I selling to? Would they want it differently? Do I slightly tweak my business? Do I tweak the way I sell it? You know, how am I going to satisfy their need for my product? How am I going to make sure they know of their need for my product? How am I going to anticipate a need they don't even have? So it's just about literally this kind of, you know, almost virtual reality of getting into a customer's world because they're still there. They're still alive. They're going to come out alive and kicking and it might be slow, but they're going to want products again. You know, we, we're humans. We want to get out there. I can't wait to bloody get out. I think I'm going to do any more online shopping really after this. I tell you, it's just, um, you know, I think we, we all feel the same and it's, it's how we feel the customers are going to feel. So again, it's personal. If you feel you need something, then it's most likely 20 other people need it and most likely 20,000 people need it. So be out there, have your tentacles out there. And if you've got a business, hold on bootstrap, keep your costs low so that you are there and ready and still on the table when the good times come. And, you know, we've always had bad times and it's going to be good times again. You know, that article that's been going on the internet um, from that American professor that maybe the roaring 20s will come back of decadence and spending and yay! You know, let's just be ready for that, I think. Oh, absolutely. And I completely concur with you. I cannot wait to walk around shops and just touch everything yeah. and take things to a oh cashier and smile at a real person. That's it for me. Yeah. No more online shopping. I'm going 100% bricks and mortar. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'd like to talk briefly about passion. At the start of our chat, we tentatively talked about passion. Everyone talks about following your passion. And I love that you have a bit of a spin on this. You're like, no way. You can't always turn your passion into your business. So what's your approach? That's right. Absolutely. Because I think um, passion is such a big word, isn't it? That even now in my career where genuinely, I think, um, you know, I can say I, I absolutely love, I mean, I actually almost like love a Monday morning. Like, so I mean, I just love the weekday starting because I, I love what I've done for the last um, God, I'm 20 years or something like that. So I absolutely love what I do. And am I passion? I mean, the passion is just, am I doing my passion? It's such a difficult question to ask. And, you know, I just think it's not passion. For me, what passion is, it's where, it, it's the coming together of who you are, as in what tools you have, what tools you were born in, born with, what, where your, what Ricardo Semler actually calls your reservoir of talent, because we're all born with a certain, you know, there's something everyone is good at, you know what I mean? It, it could be the most esoteric thing, but there's some talent everyone's got. There's some area that comes easily to them. So I think your life's journey should be finding out what is it that you can do? You know, what, what is it special about you? Because everyone's got a star. Everyone's got something special about them. So I'm finding, you know, what is it that you're good at? And then making sure what you do is what you're good at. Because often what you're good at is a great signal of um, what you'll enjoy doing. And so what you'll enjoy doing is, it, that's really is passion, I think. You know, when you're playing to your strength, um, because for me, for example, you know, when I was a lawyer, I just, you know, I, I was really passionate about working in the law firm. But once I started, I realized I'm actually not a great lawyer. But when I went into entrepreneurship and I've always loved, you know, I love my morning coffee. I love pastries. I love stuff like that. And making that happen was something that I love doing. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I can be resourceful. I love looking at stuff. I love researching as a consumer. Even if I didn't, I'm always researching stuff. So it's sort of, it's almost played to my strength. So Passion, I think, is more like see what placed your strength see, and, and make sure that what you're doing is, is doing something that placed your strength. Because if you're using your reservoir of talent, if you're playing your strengths, then by definition, you're going to enjoy it. And going to work every day, enjoying what you do, is, 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 that, that's amazing. That's what you should be seeking. And perhaps if you are successful at what you do, then your passion might be something that, that doesn't make money. Then you can pursue your passion. But 
you know, I'm not sure if, I don't know, do you know, Bex, what your passion is? I mean, it's just such a big word, isn't it, for people to try to find what their passion is. I mean, it's just it's too much of an onus we put ourselves to find out. It's just it's just too strong a word, I think. Yeah, it's too easy to feel like a failure when you examine exactly. what you do for a living and think, is it my passion? It's too big a concept. It's like saying you should feel happy all the time, and that's impossible. You would just explode the best you can have are those moments of happiness and then deep satisfaction and contentment. That's what a human being should have. You can't be like, ooh, over the top all the time. Absolutely. And I know it's almost like kind of that whole expression of being in the flow. You know, when you're in the flow, time goes by really quickly. You love it. You know what I mean? So after a day like that, when you have just not been counting the hours and you've loved it and you felt challenged and you've learned... What more do you want, really, than that? You finish the day and think, wow, that, that was an amazing day. Full stop. <laughs> that is, I think, a great place to stop because I've loved it. I've been challenged. I've learned. This whole interview has been such a pleasure. Thank you, Saha. You're incredible. I can't wait to speak to you again. You're an amazing interviewer as well. I've, I've loved that chat. Thank you. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. And best of luck with everything. You have to tell Thank me you. if you're doing a speaking gig because I want to come along and watch. Yeah, no, funny. I've actually, Bix, I'm on the thing. I'm actually launching something really exciting. Oh, yes. Tell us. Um, I, well, I'm starting a campaign, which I think we're going to need uh, post-COVID because uh, women's businesses have been, you know, disproportionately affected by COVID because of the burden of homeschooling and you know, majority of jobs lost have been female jobs. And so female entrepreneurship has really taken a hit. And really, when we're thinking about our economic recovery, um, you know, if the same amount of women as men started businesses, um, it adds something like 200 billion to the UK economy. So I want to really back female entrepreneurship. And um, the way uh, this sort of campaign is going to do it is um, from a tweet I saw. And the tweet was wonderful um, from Jacqueline de Rocas, who's president of Tech um, Nation, and she said, listen, instead of, you know, not everyone can mentor a female business, not everyone can invest in it, but just buy from women-owned businesses. So this campaign is buy women built. When Before you buy, just think and look at products. You don't know how many products are sold by women and buy from these, from these businesses. And this not only helps those businesses, but it's like a beacon for female entrepreneurship um, and our economy. So um, I'm launching this campaign um, for International Women's Day called Buy Women Built and I'm really excited by it. Oh, I love it. I'm in. I'll be there buying. Lovely. Hey, thanks for watching. A quick favour from me. If you're on YouTube and you enjoyed the show, please let us know. Like, comment or subscribe. And if you want to know more, you can find the show notes and loads of other goodies over at sage.com slash podcast. Next time, we are bringing you a bumper International Women's Day episode with three incredible entrepreneurs, so don't miss it.